Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us for our webinar, Protecting Our Patients, Addressing COVID-19 Vaccine Misinformation, Hesitancy and Resistance for People with Chronic Kidney Disease. I'm Dr. Keith Balovich, the Chief Medical Officer at Ascension St. John Hospital and the Director of Ascension Kidney Care. I'm also the President of the Renal Physicians Association. I'm happy to be joined today by Dr. Junichi Ishigami from Johns Hopkins University, who is a nephrologist and epidemiologist with a wealth of information regarding uh, vaccine and vaccine hesitancy. Our next slide uh, shows our financial disclosures. But before we begin, we wanted to thank Moderna for their partnership and support of this event. In full transparency, today's content was developed by our speakers alone without any input from Moderna. We also want to remind you that this program is not accredited for continuing education credit. And with that, uh, let's lead off uh, with uh, Junichi in our program. Thank, thank you, Keith, for the introduction. So in this section, I'll be talking about overcoming COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy and resistance, empowering healthcare professionals with effective strategies. Here's the outline. First, I'll be talking about the brief overview of the COVID-19 pandemic, and then the impact of vaccine hesitancy and misinformation during the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll also briefly cover a topic of the role of social media in spreading misinformation. And finally, we will think about a few strategies for healthcare professionals to counter COVID-19 misinformation from social media. COVID-19 becomes endemic after the pandemic, and it continues to pose a substantial threat. The figure on the left shows the number of deaths due to COVID-19 over the last year, and the number of deaths peaked at around 2,500 per week in somewhere in January. This number is comparable or even greater as compared to the deaths due to influenza, where the number of deaths peaked at around 900 per week um, in, the, in the same period. Long COVID or post-acute sequel leave of COVID-19 is another long-term consequence of the pandemic. Long COVID is defined by persistent relapsing or new symptoms or other health efforts occurring after acute infection with COVID-19. Although data have been sparse, in a study from Netherlands, the incidence of long COVID was reported to be 29% in CKDG5 and 4 and 5, 21% in hemodialysis, and 24% in kidney transplant recipients. This number appears to be much higher as compared to the CDC report, where the incidence of long COVID was 6.4% in the U.S. adults in the general population. Currently, the CDC stated that the COVID-19 vaccination is recommended for everyone aged six months and older in the United States for the prevention of COVID-19. The CDC also recommends that the people should stay up to date with COVID-19 vaccination. And currently, there are three COVID-19 vaccines that are available in the United States. COVID-19 vaccines need to be up to date because COVID-19 variants change over time. The figure on the right shows the major circulating strains of COVID-19 over the last six months. And as we can see, the, the dominant strains change rapidly over time, almost on a weekly basis. Therefore, vaccine formulas should be updated every year, just similar to what we are doing for the influenza vaccine. For example, for the year of 2024 to 2025, the COVID-19 vaccines will target a variant of KP2 flirt. Clearly, the vaccination has been the most effective way to prevent severe COVID-19. This is data from the CDC. And if you look at the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccination for the prevention of severe form of COVID-19 like hospitalization and critical illness, the vaccines are pretty much effective in reducing the risk of these conditions. In addition, it is important to acknowledge that the vaccines are effective regardless of the underlying status of documented immunocompromising conditions. 
COVID-19 vaccines are also effective in reducing the risk of long COVID. In this study of U.S. veterans, the authors reported that vaccinated persons had a lower cumulative incidence of long COVID at one year as compared to unvaccinated persons. And then the vaccines are effective regardless of Delta or Omicron era. People with chronic kidney disease are at risk of COVID-19 hospitalization and mortality and therefore it is particularly important for people with chronic kidney disease to get vaccinated against COVID-19. However, when we look at the percentage of dialysis patients who are up to date with COVID-19 vaccine, the number is far below the optimal level. As of July 2024, less than 10% of patients on dialysis were up to date with COVID-19 vaccine. In the next few slides, I'd like to discuss the potential impact of vaccine hesitancy during the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the WHO SAGE Working Group on Vaccine Hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy is defined by delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccination despite the availability of vaccination services. It is important to acknowledge that the status of vaccine hesitancy is not binary, but continuous. Some people may accept all vaccines, whereas some other people accept some vaccines but delay or refuse some other vaccines. There may be some other people who refuse all vaccines, but these people are still unsure about decisions about refusing all the vaccines. And finally, there are a fraction of people who refuse all vaccines. When it comes to the COVID-19 vaccine, People have different reasons for non-vaccination. This survey was conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau, where they asked participants why they did not get the COVID-19 vaccine. People have different reasons, but if you look at the, the common reasons for non-vaccination, some people are concerned about possible side effects. Some people do not trust COVID-19 vaccines and some people do not trust the government. And the common theme here are people are concerned about the side effects of the vaccine or they do not trust the, the COVID-19 vaccine. Indeed, there has been an increase, increasing influence of social media during the COVID-19 pandemic. In this study, uh, the authors investigated the, the proportion of COVID misinformation on social media such as Twitter and Facebook. And the study found that the, 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 the percentage of misinformation ranged from 0.2% to 28.8%. Such infodemic may have contributed to a wide spread of misinformation and subsequent vaccine hesitancy and resistance. Indeed, anti-vaxxers have been using the exactly the same strategy to spread their argument since the first development of the, the smallpox vaccine by Edward Jenner in 1794. And their argument is like first to downplay the risk of the disease, saying like it's just the flu, and then claim vaccines are harmful and ineffective think like you have a greater chance of dying from vaccines than you do from COVID-19. They often introduce a conspiracy theory like the U.S. government was behind the scene and created the virus. They also use alternative authorities to claim the legitimacy to their views. For example, they may say Dr. X spoke out, spoke out against COVID-19 vaccines but just because Dr. X exposed the truth about the vaccine, he or, she, he or she was fired. And then the goal of these anti-vaxxers was to, to provoke people's anxiety to get vaccinated. Indeed, a fraction of anti-COVID-19 vaccine spreaders were responsible for the majority of misinformation. 
this NPR article revealed that there were only 12 people who are behind most vaccine hawks on social media, which is responsible for 62% of misinformation on social media. Another study revealed that these 11 websites are responsible for the majority of misinformation about COVID-19 on internet. Social media use has been associated with perceptions about vaccine safety. In this study, percentage proportion believing vaccines are unsafe was less than 10% among never social media users. However, among those who use social media regularly, the proportion of people believing that vaccines were unsafe was much higher and there seems to be a dose response association between the frequency of social media use and the proportion believing vaccines are unsafe. When people have questions about the, the vaccine, they may look up different sources of information, such as newspaper, television, internet, social media, or their doctors or healthcare professionals. Depending on the information that they got, some people may decide to accept vaccine, or in some cases, they may decide to, 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 uh, to become the vaccine hesitant. Therefore, it is important to, to understand where people usually get information about COVID-19 vaccine. This study addressed such a, a research question where the investigators try to understand what are the primary sources of information on COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccine, and responses were stratified by the status of vaccine hesitancy, either accepting the vaccine or hesitant or resistant to the COVID-19 vaccine. The study, the study found that regardless of vaccine hesitancy, People mostly use television and internet as a source of vaccine information. If you look at those with vaccine hesitancy, these people were more likely to rely on social media or information from family or friends. On the other hand, doctors and healthcare professionals were actually least used as a source of information, indicating that there may be underutilization of healthcare providers' information during the pandemic. The same study also examined what would be the most trusted sources of information. And for that question, the study found that even among people with vaccine hesitancy, their doctors and healthcare professionals were the most trusted sources of COVID-19 information suggesting that it is important to leverage this and promote vaccination through healthcare providers. In the final few minutes, I'd like to discuss a few potential approaches to addressing vaccine misinformation. First, we need to develop a strategy to counter the anti-vaccine sentiment. We can also leverage the trusted relationship between providers and patients. Finally, it is important to guide patients to proper vaccine sources so that patients do not need to, to look up unreliable sources of internet information through social media or internet. Strategy to counter the anti-vaccine sentiment through social media is a challenging task, but at least we can start from analyzing online search to better understand people's root causes of concern. This process is called social listening, and we now know that many people are concerned about the potential side effects of the COVID-19 vaccine. We then need to adopt understandable communication strategies tailored for their concern, and then reach out to as many as possible through credible organizations. In this context, kidney communities or organizations like National Kidney Foundation or American Society of Nephrology may have much things to do to serve 
on this role. It is also important to leverage the trusted relationship. In this study, the investigators asked participants which healthcare pro professionals um, do they rely on for CPD treatment and advice. The study found that more than half of patients with CKD under nephrology care trusted nephrologists most relative to other providers like primary care providers and other specialty doctors. Therefore, nephrology care can serve, can play an important role to promote vaccination while leveraging this trusted relationship between patients with CKD and nephrology care providers. Another idea is to develop a targeted campaign through nephrology care. There are multiple interventions that have been proven to be effective to increase the, the uptake of vaccination, such as provider reminder, standing orders, and on-site vaccination. We can consider implementing some of these programs within nephrology care. Another approach would be to provide educational materials tailored for patients' needs, such as concerns about vaccine benefits and risks. We can also consider providing educational opportunities for providers so they can be more confident about communicating about the, the need for vaccines with their patients. Finally, guiding patients to proper vaccine sources is also important. Importantly, both ASN and NKF have dedicated websites to promote vaccination. So we can guide patients to, to look up these sources of information rather than letting them look up their own sources of information about COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccines. Before I end this section, I'd like to read iterates the importance of simple nudge to promote vaccination. This study looked at the, the uptake of influenza vaccination, and the study found that when people visited with the doctor, the flu shot uptake was increased from 32% to 48%, simply if the flu shot was, re was recommended by the provider. Additionally, if the flu shot was recommended and offered simultaneously, the percentage was increased to 67%. Therefore, as much as it is important to think about communication skill set or behavioral techniques to, to persuade patients to accept vaccination, it is often um, works pretty much well by simply nudging patients talking about the need for vaccination, saying like, you know, you need a vaccine, you know, let's make sure you get vaccinated before you, you go home. And that kind of approach pretty much works well to increase the number of patients who get vaccinated against uh, the various diseases that are preventable through vaccination. So in summary, COVID-19 continues to pose a significant public health risk, especially for people with chronic kidney disease. COVID-19 vaccine uptake remains below optimal level, and vaccine hesitancy may arise for various reasons, with concerns on side effects being most common. Social media is often used as a platform to spread misinformation, and addressing vaccine misinformation is crucial to promoting vac vaccination in this regard. Nephrology care providers should play a key role in communicating with patients to address vaccine hesitancy and misinformation. In the next section, I'll be talking about addressing challenges, trust, equity, and communication strategies. Here is the outline. At first, we'll be briefly discuss the disparities in the COVID-19 pandemic in people with chronic kidney disease, and, and then challenges of mistrust during the pandemic and vaccination efforts. I would like to introduce the potential impact of politicizing the pandemic. And finally, we would like to think about a few strategies for addressing mistrust and promoting health equity. This figure shows the trends in racial and ethnic disparities in COVID-19 hospitalization stratified by U.S. regions. 
we can see across all the regions compared to white adults, those with Hispanic, Asian, and Black individuals had a higher risk of hospitalization with COVID-19. And other data demonstrated that mortality was increased in these race and ethnic groups. This trend was also seen in patients on hemodialysis. In this early study in 2020 from New York City, Black and Hispanic patients on hemodialysis had 1.76 to 2.66 fold higher risk of COVID-19 compared to white patients on hemodialysis. Health disparities have been known in people with chronic kidney disease even prior to the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Underlying reasons for health disparities are complex but may be attributable to multiple factors, including social and structural determinants of health, racism, and discrimination. Adverse social determinants of health, such as economic instability, less educational opportunity, or less support from social or family members, as well as limited access to healthcare, may disproportionately affect these racial and ethnic minorities, leading a high burden of kidney disease and its associated conditions like cardiovascular disease in this population. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic appeared to have magnified these health disparities. Many factors like poverty, limited access to healthcare, or limited support from social networks or family members can contribute to overexposure to COVID-19, delay in seeking healthcare, or inadequate treatment when they got COVID-19. These factors led to a higher risk of COVID-19 and its complications such as acute kidney injury or progression of CKD, as well as mortality due to COVID-19. Mistrust in medicine is another issue during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mistrust is defined by the belief that the entity that is the object of mistrust is acting against one's best interests or well-being, and it is attrib attributable to multiple factors, including uh, individual level, where mistrust of healthcare providers, or system level, mistrust of healthcare systems or hospitals, or policy level, mistrust of government agency or local authorities. In addition, it is important to acknowledge that mistrust is often experienced by social groups, such as racial and ethnic groups. Mistrust is often rooted in structural racism, and importantly, it is not limited to the mere relationship between physicians and patients, but it encompasses broader systemic issues. The investigators administered a 12-item questionnaire to assist medical mistrust in U.S. adults, for example, participants were asked a question like people of my ethnic group should be suspicious of information from doctors and healthcare workers. The study found that compared to white adults, Black, Hispanic, and Asian adults had a higher degree of mistrust on COVID-19 vaccine, suggesting that COVID-19 vaccine mistrust could be more prevalent in racial and ethnic minorities compared to white adults. Disparities in attitudes toward a COVID vaccines were also seen even prior to the first availability of the COVID-19 vaccine. In this study, participants were asked whether they had intention to get vaccinated once the COVID-19 vaccine became available. The study found that 20% of Black adults versus 8% of white adults stated that they had no intention to get vaccinated. And then when they were asked a reason for no intention to get vaccinated, 33% cited the lack of trust, such as distrust of vaccines or distrust of government or pharmaceutical companies or distrust of vaccine development or testing processes. Medical mistrust has been significantly associated with COVID-19 vaccination status. In this study, the investigators compare the medical mistrust index 
between those who did and did not receive the COVID-19 vaccine. And they found that the score was significantly higher among those who did not receive the COVID-19 vaccine, whereas the, the score was comparable for everyday discrimination skill scale between the two groups. The authors reported that the adjusted odds ratio of receiving COVID-19 vaccine was 16% lower with every one increase in the medical mistrust index, whereas the association was not significant for everyday discrimination scale. This figure shows the cumulative uptake of COVID-19 vaccination in older adults with CKD using data from Medicare um, in US with RDS. This data is a little bit old, censoring as June 2021, but we can still appreciate that the uptake of COVID-19 vaccination was suboptimal, and also Black and Hispanic adults were less likely to receive COVID-19 vaccine compared to, to white older adults with chronic kidney disease. Politicization and polarization during the COVID-19 pandemic is another issue. This is an interesting study reported from the field of social science, where the authors examined the frequency of the appearance of politicians and scientists in the newspaper coverage of COVID-19. They found that in the newspaper coverage, politicians appeared more frequently than scientists raising the possibility that more information could be delivered through the lens of politics rather than science. The authors concluded that the high degree of politicization in the COVID-19 coverage may have contributed to polarization in the U.S. COVID-19 attitude. This is another interesting study looking at the partisanship and blame in the COVID-19 pandemic. In this study, participants were asked about their behavior changes during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the study found that um, when the, the responses were stratified by either Democrat or Republican supporters, partisan affiliation had little impact on individuals' COVID-19 prevention behaviors such as avoid contact, wash hands, or wear mask or PPE. However, when people were asked about blame attributions, Democrat and Republican supporters frequently blamed each other, attributing the pandemic to the failures in implementing proper countermeasures, like Democrats blaming Trump or Republicans, whereas Republicans blaming Democrats. Another issue is uh, the disparity in the uptake of COVID-19 vaccine by geographical areas. And this may be partly influenced by the political inclination of leadership or local um, governor or local leadership in terms which can differ by state. I would like to, to share some of the ideas to potentially addressing mistrust and COVID-19 disparities. First, I think it is important to help reach people through community and build trustworthiness to address mi mistrust in medicine. It is also important when we think about developing educational materials, such materials need to be culturally competent and finally, I'd like to throw an idea of prioritizing healthcare professionals from ethnic minorities for vaccination to increase trust. This is an example of the program trying to outreach people through community and to promote COVID-19 vaccination. This program was conducted in partnership between Johns Hopkins University, local communities, and local governments. And this program focused on COVID-19 vaccine education and equity and consists of multiple, multiple components, including web-based educational content, culturally adapted media campaigns, and community and faith education outreach. The program successfully vaccinated over 3,000 people in the first three months 
And importantly, 90% of these people self-identified self -identified as persons with color. Another important thing is to develop and distribute culturally competent and visually appealing materials. And this is again an example of COVID-19 vaccine poster. And if you go to the website, this poster is available in three languages, including English, Spanish, and Arabic. The location of the provision of COVID-19 vaccine may matter as well. In this study, patients on hemodialysis were asked where they received the COVID-19 vaccine. And among white patients on hemodialysis, more people received the COVID-19 vaccine in other locations than dialysis clinic, whereas Hispanic and Black patients on hemodialysis were more likely to receive the COVID-19 vaccine in a dialysis clinic. These findings may suggest that offering vaccines in a convenient location by a trusted source, like a dialysis clinic staff, may be helpful to increase the number of people with chronic kidney disease who are vaccinated in this population. Finally, this is the idea of prioritizing healthcare professionals from ethnic minorities for vaccination to increase trust. In this study, the investigators delivered tailored COVID-19 health messages to Black and Latin U.S. adults. The study found that Black Americans were more likely to trust people providing health information if they were from their own racial or ethnic group. The same trend was not observed in Latinx participants. On the other hand, when the message was tailored to acknowledge the racism in healthcare, such an approach did not yield any difference in terms of the level of trust in either uh, Black Americans or Latin U.S. adults. So in summary, the COVID-19 pandemic has magnified disparities in people with chronic kidney disease. Mistrust often rooted in structural racism is a major contributor to COVID-19 disparities. The politicization of the pandemic hindered public health efforts to manage the crisis and promote vaccination. Community outreach is crucial in addressing mistrust and advancing health equity. And I'd like to emphasize again that nephrology care should present important opportunity to promote vaccination through offering tailored educational materials that are culturally competent or convenient vaccination opportunity from a trusted um, location like a dialysis clinic. And that's all I have for this section. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jimichi. And indeed, uh, it is the, the patient's trust in their care providers is really what makes a difference in our overall ability of trying to protect our patients. Because that's really uh, what our goal is, is to indeed protect our patients. So, um, going further from that practical standpoint into um, the day in the life of the nephrology provider. We realize uh, that we are working in multiple spheres, often uh, balancing several different subgroups of patients, all which carry different vulnerabilities to viral illness that of course we have the opportunity to, protect, to potentially protect them from. Um, we all spend a majority of time in acute care facilities in the hospital which is not the opportune, opportune place to start thinking about immunization. But in those other uh, three areas, and particularly the chronic kidney disease clinic, where we have the greatest opportunity, at least to have those very uh, careful conversations, as well as in dialysis, where we're being held accountable to influenza vaccine, the importance is, are we addressing the opportunity to provide updated 2024, 2025 COVID-19 vaccine as well? It's an important aspect that at least once a year, we should be reviewing the, the status of our patients and where that potential lies. As well as those of us that are involved in transplant care, 
know that this uh, 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 group of patients are particularly vulnerable and most importantly that we have the right vaccines in place. The problem is, of course, these spheres do overlap in certain times, but sometimes they're also siloed and purposely siloed, which adds a, a different barrier, a different challenge into our everyday existence. What are some of those barriers and how can we overcome them, of course, is to try and put all these puzzle pieces together. Care coordination is going to be the key. One thing that we've discussed in um, a work group through the National Kidney Foundation is the importance of having a broad-based uh, immunization status and medical record documentation, regardless of where the delivery uh, site of care occurs. Uh, the sad truth is we know that that comes with a lot of uh, controversy and difficulty in trying to um, carry this out on a national scale. What we do want to do is encourage our patients, though, to at least keep our medical records up to date wherever possible with regard to those immunization statuses. And of course, um, that is uh, distributed widely in a lot of different areas in order to maintain. Um, the question becomes, whose responsibility is it? And uh, Janichi has brought up that concept that uh, patients trust us, and particularly patients with kidney disease trust their nephrologist primarily versus the primary care. Unfortunately, when it comes to COVID-19 vaccine, we tend not to be the ones administering, administering that vaccine at the same time. But it is important that they do trust us with our opinions and with the importance of uh, the direction in the care and the willingness to accept that vaccine. And eventually uh, coordinating uh, with the eventual vaccine administrator, who is gonna deliver that where are those uh, facilities located and what's the most uh, economical and of course uh, prompt way to deliver that vaccine once you've convinced the patient that indeed they're ready and anxious to to have that protection so it comes with the four phase approach is really how i see it from uh, our perspective in delivering uh, kidney care one is the preparation ahead of time by watching this webinar already, we can tell that you have uh, a desire to provide this resource and expertise to your patients. We know it's important because uh, even, the subspe even the primary care physicians defer to the subspecialists and our opinions, making sure that these vaccines are not going to pose a threat to their kidney disease and or to their overall health. Uh, the second is communication. We cannot overemphasize the importance of communicating not only within the kidney space between the kidney care clinic, the hospital, and the dialysis unit, but also among providers that these that our patients often overlap with. So it becomes a very confusing puzzle to try and uh, make sure that the right individuals are, are communicating back and forth. Lastly is the administration. Know where those places are in your community so that you can be prepared ahead of time to deliver on the promise of administering that uh, vaccine promptly and carefully and quickly. We're blessed to have an outpatient pharmacy who's administering right in our office space. So it allows us the opportunity to, to, to be prompt in delivering that care. And then lastly, follow up. Patients come to you for your expertise and guidance. As Janichi has uh, highlighted, um, patients are not always willing or accepting right from the beginning. So it's important to lay the foundation, share with them the information, and then making sure that we follow up on a subsequent visit to ensure that indeed that information was heard um, and, and, and carried through. So uh, it requires lots of coordination. As we've highlighted, uh, your influence matters. 96% of the US adults admit their physician is the trusted source of medical information. So you have the resources at your disposal uh, and it's important that knowing that your words matter. And kidney patients will often say that have participated in our focus groups, you know me best and know my condition. So I trust your opinion that you're gonna keep me safe. And that's it. one of the, rewarding aspects of being a nephrologist is that ongoing relationship with our patients. The key factor in all of this, as highlighted uh, by Janichi as well, is never dismiss those patients' concerns. They may bring misinformation to you. It's important to acknowledge the fact that, yes, they have received this information. It may not be accurate, and or but to not to belittle and or confuse the patient 
by dismissing their concerns. That is a perfect way of turning your patient off immediately. We often like to carry out the teach back method of at least saying, here's the information, the way I handle it, how do you see it, and, and, and how can I convince you differently? The other is the presumptive model, making sure in your own mind, we're ready and prepared ahead of time to ensure that our goal is to do what's best for our patients, and that's to protect them from viral illness and devastating consequences of viral illness, and particularly of COVID-19, as Junichi has, has highlighted. And most importantly, designate a clinic champion. Um, if we don't measure it in or follow through on our own clinics to make sure that our staff are in line with our opinions and our positions, uh, making sure that we have someone who is passionate about it. They can drive success to tremendous levels within your group by checking on how well we're doing as a whole within our practice. Are we achieving the goals that we've expected? And most importantly, following up again with those patients uh, through that uh, care coordinator or that care champion to make sure that additional information may be needed or follow up. Uh, and lastly, participating in the advocacy process, being part of the NKF, ASN, and or the Renal Physicians Association are ways that we can help promote because we realize that there's very little information about chronic kidney disease patients and their response rates to these immunizations. We realize that there's really a paucity of solid good data with regard to our, um, our protection. We know that it is helpful and it works, but more importantly, uh, how effective is it across the entire continuum of chronic kidney disease? And where is our best opportunities lie in making sure we're protecting our patient to the fullest? Lastly, put it in writing. If the patient has agreed then make sure that we have a prescription handy or something that uh, definitely uh, sh where we've shared with our patient the opportunity that indeed they are um, involved and engaged in that process of getting uh, their vaccine and that protection. So with that, uh, we appreciate you taking the time today to share with us and joining us. We hope that this is helpful for you and your practice. And again, we thank Moderna for their generous support of this event. We dropped a survey link into the chat. Please provide us with your feedback when you're able. We'd love to hear from you about opportunities of where we can make this better and or expand on this information. And once again, we thank you all for attending. Have a great day.